Hello. Menace in Moscow, meltdown at the by-election ballot box, and the star of our screens on stage, Matt Smith. Disaster for depressed Tories. Two more huge losses at the ballot box. Midterm by-elections are always difficult for incumbent governments, and the circumstances of these by-elections were, of course, particularly challenging. And the R word, recession, rears its ugly head. There's no sign the country's going to get much richer anytime soon. But despite its victories, the Labour Party had its own problems too. The spectre of anti-Semitism returned. Two candidates suspended this week after their comments were leaked. It is a huge thing to withdraw support for a Labour candidate. It's a tough decision, a necessary decision. And the death of Alexei Navalny, Russian opposition politician, reminded our leaders this week of the serious challenges abroad. So we're asking this morning, how can our politicians calm the storm? The man who wants to be the next foreign secretary has been mingling with other leaders in Munich. Labour's David Lammy joins us. Another family waits. The wife of a different political prisoner in Russia, Evgenia Karamurza, is back with us too. After by-election batterings, Conservative Minister Michael Tomlinson is here. Wake up. Wake up. I want to say something. Wake up. You might know him from The Crown or from Doctor Who, so get ready to wake up for actor Matt Smith. Morning, morning. With me at the desk throughout, Tracy Ann Oberman, actress and author, as comfortable in Albert Square as on the West End stage. Douglas Alexander, Labour cabinet minister in the 2000s, now fancying a comeback as an MP next time round. And Robert Buckland, who was in Boris Johnson's cabinet, hoping to hang on to his seat. Let's start, as ever, with what's making the news this morning. The Sunday Times claims Russian intelligence officers visited Alexei Navalny in jail just two days before his death. And the sack box of the post office tells the paper the government did try to delay compensation to postmasters until after the election. The Observer says Ukraine is pleading for more arms as the war's two-year anniversary approaches this week. The Sunday Telegraph splashes on Keir Starmer, accusing Donald Trump of bad faith in his comments about NATO. And three of the tabloids join in all saying there is no way back for Prince Harry to any royal role. So a mixed bunch in the newspapers there. Let's talk about what has been the biggest story in the world this week, the death of Alexei Navalny. Now, Douglas, you were a foreign affairs minister with responsibility for Russia back in the early 2000s. Why did it take politicians so long to realise he was such a, a bad guy? I think with the benefit of hindsight, the West collectively was too slow in recognising Putin's character. Remember, George W. Bush gave an interview back in 2001. He said, I've looked in this man's eyes and he is honest and straightforward. The reality is Putin never accepted the outcome of the Cold War. He said the greatest tragedy of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union, and that was from a country that had lost 30 million people in the course of the Second World War. So the reality is that the true character of the man, I'm afraid, has again been revealed again this week. We've seen not just Navalny first imprisoned, then poisoned, then sent to an Arctic penal colony. Um, the Kremlin have heavy responsibility, and I fear have blood on their hands, coming just two years next week after their invasion of Ukraine. And Robert, you were in government when Skripal yeah. was poisoned and also Magnitsky, another yeah. activist. Why do you think governments did take so long? Look, I think they wanted to believe that Russia had changed and they wanted to think that they had somebody who was stable, who was committed to the same values as the rest of us. It's a familiar pattern in history, sadly, mm. uh, and now it's quite clear that the, the Russians seem to think that uh, omission, acts of omission are less serious than direct acts of commission. In other words, you almost deliberately neglect people. That's what mm. happened to Sergei Magnitsky. It's what's happened to Alexander Navalny. Uh, but the world is wise to this. We know, as Douglas says, that uh, omission is just as bad as a sin of commission. They have blood on their hands and they need to answer for their crimes. Tracy-Anne, just as a, as, a, as a human being, mm. 
What did you think when you heard this news? Oh, so deeply sad. I mean, Navalny was such a brave, brave man. You know, he, he effectively sacrificed himself to be an opponent to Putin. And he, he took it on himself to say things that were, you know, unacceptable to Putin and ultimately lost his life for it. Really sad. In terms though, of what should happen next, you two have both been cabinet ministers. What could the UK government do? Well, I think, uh, forgive me, I think that um, the, the, the measures we took after Magnitsky to create named targeted visa bans for people who commit human rights violations is a clear way forward. We've got to mark this by taking more direct action. So there must be action. Douglas, briefly. Of course, there'll be a statement in the Commons, mm. but Navalny died in the cause of freedom. The greatest single way we can honour his life is to arm those who are defending freedom today, yeah. and that's the Ukrainians. I was in Ukraine after the conflict began. They have a limitless level of courage, but they have profoundly limited armaments. They need our help. We need to get the US package that's stuck on the House of Representatives out the door and get that aid and military support to where it's needed. OK, well, we'll talk about that a bit later on in the programme. And amongst all the diplomatic outrage, at its heart, the death of Alexei Navalny is the loss of a husband and father one brave individual and one brave family. But they're not the first to suffer at the hands of Putin and they are unlikely to be the last. You probably remember Evgenia Karamurza, a remarkable woman we met back in June. Her husband, Vladimir, is an activist and a journalist and has been locked up by Putin with a sentence of 25 years. She told us back in the summer that she believed his life was in danger. How does she feel now? I was horrified, but not surprised because uh, the use of political assassination as a method of dealing with uh, opponents has been there for, uh, well, for the entire rule of Vladimir Putin. He's been using this method uh, since early 2000s. This was a murder uh, for which Vladimir Putin is responsible. All that impunity that lasted for decades led him to believe that he's somehow untouchable. And for as long as he's sitting in the Kremlin unchecked, we will see more warmonging, we will see more repression, and we will see more deaths. You told us in June you feared for your husband's life. Has what's happened in the last couple of days increased that sense of foreboding? I have been afraid for my husband's life since at least 2015 since that first call that I received about Vladimir collapsing in Moscow and going into coma with a multiple organ failure. For no reason at all. An absolutely healthy, healthy man with no medical conditions whatsoever, just collapsing and going into a coma with a multiple organ failure. I had been sleeping with my phone since, dreading yet another call of that sort. I believe that my husband's life is in danger as are lives of many other political prisoners in Russian prisons, because these people are kept behind bars um, very often with serious medical conditions, with no proper medical treatment, and they're kept in such conditions uh, in order to make their state of health deteriorate. You must be on edge all the time. You said you sleep with your phone. What goes through your mind when it rings? With all of that is that's happening, I cannot afford breaking down. I cannot afford being afraid. I cannot afford just the, just the normal uh, human feeling of fear. I have to always fight that and step over it and say, yes, I am afraid, but that is not important right now. Continuing the fight is important. Telling the stories of those people who are suffering from the regime is important. Today, people are getting arrested for laying flowers to the memorials of uh, victims of repression. So that's, um, that situation is deteriorating, it seems, by the day. What would you like Western leaders to do? Get on the same page with the help to Ukraine. The U.S. Congress has been debating that aid to Ukraine for how long now? And uh, they uh, seem to be finally, finally agreeing that it is needed. But come on, did Alexei Navalny have to die for this to happen? Vladimir Putin uh, 
will reappoint himself president of the Russian Federation in less than a month. And uh, I mean, for almost a quarter of a century, he's been in power. And according to international organizations, the last free but not fair election in Russia took place in 2003. So I have uh, this question to the international community. Will it maybe finally say that Vladimir Putin is an illegitimate leader when it uh, comes to political prisoners? Yes, more should be done to get those whose lives are in danger out. These people who are being now slowly killed, these are, they represent that alternative to Vladimir Putin. And if they're not saved, who is going to be there to rebuild the country from scratch? Who is going to make Russia into a democracy if not these people who have stood up, held their, I don't know, with, with their heads held high and said no? Evgenia, thanks so much for joining us again. Well, as this nightmare deepens, what can or should our politicians do? The annual Munich Security Conference, where leaders are gathering, has an added urgency this year. David Lamy, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, is there with Keir Starmer. A bit earlier this morning, I asked him how he responded to Evgenia's demand that Putin be held to account. Well, look, uh, we've been calling for a special tribunal for crimes of aggression and against humanity. I'd like to see Putin in front of that special tribunal uh, held to account for all of his crimes, not just in Ukraine, but as we are seeing uh, just in the last 48 hours in Russia as well. And of course, as Russia held, uh, holds elections uh, this year, it's important that the international community is able to verify that they are free and fair elections. I suspect, like we've seen in the past, that that will not happen. And if that doesn't happen, Evgenia Karamoza also says it is time for Western leaders, Western politicians like you, to say Vladimir Putin is not a legitimate leader. There have not been free and fair elections for more than 20 years. Would you be ready to say that? Well, look, let us see what happens when those elections come to pass. There will be a statement from the pr Prime Minister uh, or the Foreign Secretary in the House tomorrow on the situation in Russia. They may well come forward with further sanctions. And of course, if that is the case, it will be backed by Labour. You say you'd support the government suggesting more sanctions. But do you believe there ought to be more sanctions? What would Labour do if you were the Foreign Secretary right now? Would you bring in new punishments for Vladimir Putin? Actually, the UK has led on sanctions. The issue now is the enforcement of those sanctions. And if we do have the privilege to serve, that is the area in which I will look more closely to ensure that there is the proper coordination across both the Foreign Office and the Treasury. Do you believe right now they're not being properly enforced? Well, I remain concerned about the dirty money that continues to flow through London. I remain concerned that the full implementation of the Russia report, this was following the interference in our elections and the work of our select committee have not been fully implemented. So yes, I think there are gaps. And if we are successful when the general election uh, is held, I intend to plug those gaps. You mentioned there talking to American politicians who you've met at the Munich conference where you are. Keir Starmer's had a bit of a pop at President Trump's attitude to NATO in the pages of the Sunday Telegraph this morning. You have previously called Donald Trump a woman-hating neo-Nazi sympathizer. Have you changed your views of him? Look, the truth is you'll be hard-pressed to find anybody who was in Parliament on any side who hasn't had views on some of the rhetoric that Donald Trump has used in the past. Indeed, David Cameron described him as misogynistic and xenophobic uh, in his own book. We will work with whomever is in the White House. It doesn't matter, frankly, who is the incumbent of number 10 or the White House. 
we are the closest of allies. It's a prevailing and strong partnership. It will remain that. And we should not get too carried away with the rhetoric that, of course, we'll hear over the course of the next um, few months in an election cycle. We've got to look at the actions. Let's talk about a different part of the world then, what's happening in the Middle East right now. There's another vote coming up in the Commons this week calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Now, Labour in Scotland backed that yesterday. What is wrong with that position? And will Labour su support that motion in the Commons this week? Well, we all want to see an end to the fighting. It must stop. Over 28,000 people have lost their lives, women and children. You know, one of my children uh, is adopted. 17,000 orphans now um, in Gaza. It, it's just, it's abominable. Uh, so, of course, people want to see a ceasefire. The question now is how? And to be absolutely clear, that when that ceasefire comes, we can't see the fighting restart. So will so you it vote for it in the House of Commons and this that's week? That's why I've been here with that's why I've been here with Keir Starmer, speaking to the Saudi Arabians, the Qataris, European uh, allies. I haven't seen the motion. It's not yet put down. Uh, we will scrutinise that motion, uh, as is our way in Parliament. That will come in on uh, Monday, I suspect, Tuesday. And we will take it from there. But look, let us be clear. Yes, we will have a vote in Parliament this week. It's not that vote that will bring about a ceasefire. It's the diplomatic action. It's Hamas. It's Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, it's partners for peace saying the fighting must now stop. David Lamy, the motion's actually been published already, and we've got it here. The SNP motion says this house calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and Israel. It notes with shock and distress that the death toll has now risen beyond 28,000. That is the motion. It is crystal clear. Will Labour vote for it? Well, look, I've seen that swirling around uh, social media, but that's not a motion. That's, that's just a form of words swirling around social media and well, I don't think that was the entirety that you read out and it's why I say that in all seriousness given the tremendous loss of life given the fact that we have also said in my party that we need now to uh, have Palestinian uh, recognition as a roadmap to that peace. We want to work with partners to achieve that. We've got to get to a two-state solution. We need a contact group. You can see that the complexity of this does require us to look carefully at a motion, not to comment on words that are flying around uh, social media. Uh, I, I just don't think that's the place to conduct proper diplomacy. Well, your colleague, the Scottish Labour leader, Anna Sarwar, has said the motion looks perfectly reasonable. And Scottish Labour yesterday voted for the notion of backing an immediate ceasefire. Why can't you? Well, look, I, I'm saying that I fully understand why Scottish colleagues want the fighting to stop now. We've been saying that for weeks. So we agree with them. We want the fighting to stop now. I'm not sure that what's flying around on Twitter says anything about it being sustainable. You can have a ceasefire that lasts for a few days. We want the ceasefire to last and to be permanent and to move towards the diplomatic solution. It will only be a political solution that brings an end to this. It's very clear there are tensions inside your party over how the leadership has been handling this question of the conflict in Gaza. And it has again heightened the atmosphere around people's attitude towards um, anti-Semitism. Everybody knows Labour has had terrible problems this week around its parliamentary candidates as our ally lost his position as the official Labour candidate because of remarks that he made at a meeting. Why was it not obvious that his suggestion that Israel had known in advance about the October the 7th attacks, why was it not obvious immediately that that was unacceptable and he ought to be suspended? I'm sorry um, that the initial judgment uh, uh, was that um, uh, he'd made an apology, the candidate made an apology and we could move forward. More came to light. Uh, and it was right that Keir acted decisively, I'm afraid, to suspend him and to withdraw our support to him as a Labour candidate. It does mean that the people of Rochdale will not have uh, a Labour candidate on the ticket. And I 
uh, I'm very sorry that they will not be able to vote Labour, but I absolutely stand by that decision not to support a candidate that had come up with a whole series of anti-Semitic tropes. I've spent my whole political career fighting racism wherever it's found, standing with Jewish people and saying enough is enough outside of Parliament. We cannot have any truck with anti-Semitism in our party. You have said you're sorry that the initial judgment turned out to be the wrong one. Can our viewers really, though, have confidence in the people that Labour is putting forward to stand as MPs when this kind of thing happens? Well, look, I think that uh, my sense is, because colleagues like Luciana Berger um, uh, are coming back to the Labour Party, that the Equalities and Human Rights Commission um, have given their verdict and have said that progress has been made. And look, clearly, Keir Starmer has led from the front uh, on this issue. We have turned a page uh, on this issue. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, no organisation uh, in the country would say that, sadly, there are not people who want leadership positions who do not make unacceptable mistakes and therefore have to be suspended or disciplined uh, as a result of that. But I was in Peterborough a few weeks ago with our new candidates. Uh, they are fresh, they are young, they have ability, they have track records uh, beyond actually Labour politics, many of them professionals. Uh, I believe that this next parliament is going to be very, very healthy uh, when we see uh, hopefully Labour picking up seats and those new candidates coming in to Parliament. David Lammy, thank you so much for joining us from Munich. Well, Labour is still having to grapple with anti-Semitism. In the same week that the Community Security Trust, a Jewish charity, reported a surge in the number of claims of hate against Jewish people. More than 4,000 in 2023, compared to around 1,600 the year before. Two-thirds of those incidents reported on or after the Hamas attacks on October the 7th. Well, Robin Simcox is the government's commissioner for countering extremism, and he joins us in the studio today for the first time. Welcome to you. You wrote in the autumn that the UK had become a permissive environment for anti-Semitism. The numbers suggest it's got worse since then. Do you think that has happened and why? Yeah, I think that, I mean, this has been something that's been ongoing now for six months, really since the Hamas attacks in Israel unleashed something quite ugly, I think, that was, that was uh, residing under the surface. Um, the Community Security Trust outlines this huge increase in, in assault, abuse, threats towards Jews. It's obviously completely unacceptable. And I think, you know, you don't want to speak on behalf of, of the Jewish community, but I think there's fear there. I think they feel um, like maybe they're not always being defended especially well. And I think this speaks to a broader problem with society, right? Like this isn't, this can't just be about British Jews. We have to ask ourselves, are we doing enough as a society to speak out against this? Obviously, a, an organisation like mine has a role in this, civil society has a role in this, but also government has a role in it. And what should the government do then, do you believe, to stop this? Well, I think that the government has, has done a lot. The, rhetorically, I think the Prime Minister has been very good. Um, they've, done, they've made steps like giving more money to the, the Community Security Trust, the anti-BDS bill, some of the legislation around protests. But I do think there's a chance to go further, to go faster and be bolder. Sometimes we think about the legislative question, and, and there is obviously a question around glorification of terrorism, which is ongoing, and whether, uh, whether it's currently in the right place, but also using powers we already have. Um, are we disrupting groups that uh, operate below the criminal, criminal threshold? Are we doing enough to stop abuse of charities by extremists, abuse of broadcast license by extremists? Are we ensuring that no public money goes to extremist groups? They're areas where I think the government can do more. So they could be more aggressive in using the powers that they already have, you believe? I think we could, we could play closer to the edge of the line than we currently have. I think there's some caution, there's been some timidity. This isn't just this government. I would argue this has been the case for decades, and it's part of the reason why we're in the state we're in. So you say this government and perhaps previous have been too timid to act, but you yourself previously have suggested the rise in anti-Semitism is a failed policy mix of mass migration and multiculturalism. I mean, what did you mean by that? And I think some of our viewers listening to that might find that quite a strong thing to say, sort of pointing the finger 
uh, migrants for the rise in anti-Semitism? No, not migrants. What, what I mean by that, I mean, look, we all, I think most people in this country really relish the fact that it's this fantastic multi-ethnic democracy, amazing, one of the most successful ones in the world. Uh, what I've been talking about is the fact that to sustain that, to defend that, essentially, all of us living in this country need to be able to, we can uh, sing off the, we, we can't sing off, always off the same hymn sheet, but we need to have a basic awareness of what the tune is. And that means that when parallel societies develop in one country, people are living parallel lives without any ability to integrate, generally I think that leads to a more fractured, less cohesive and more divided society. And I think that is some of the reasons why we have a, um, I've, what I've talked about, this permissive environment for extremism in this country, because we are beginning to lose that, that sort of united view about what, about what this country is. This past week, Labour has again, as we've been discussing, faced criticism of how they've handled anti-Semitism. Davy Lammy, you heard him tell us that he essentially thinks the party is now on top of the issue, although he was sorry for what happened in this last week. Do you think Labour's now on top of this? Well, Labour has had obviously historic problems with this and I, I, I wouldn't want to politicise the problem because I think this goes beyond the Labour Party. I think events of the last week demonstrate the very specific problem we face where the, this idea that there is a, um, some of the, the sentiments aired in Rochdale as a Jewish control of the media uh, or that the Israel could have allowed the attacks in Hamas to take place somehow deliberately. It speaks to a, and the fact that this wasn't necessarily challenged immediately in the room, I just think speaks to a broader problem around a conspiracism that is involved with Jewish people that isn't just a, you know, a, a modern labour problem, but this dates back centuries, right? This idea of um, Jewish control. And so, again, it's why I come back to the idea that this needs challenging on all forms of society, by all forms. What, though, about a different problem, Islamophobia? Mm. Because the Met has published figures saying there's also been a significant rise in Islamophobia since the October the 7th attacks. Are you concerned about that too? Yeah, absolutely. So at the Commission for Counter Extremism, we, have, we focus on all forms of extremist ideology. And I really see this very pronounced in the extreme right wing, this distrust, this hatred of Muslims, this attempt to try and uh, poison opinion against them. And I think you've seen, as, as you've cited, the, the, the figures which demonstrate this is a real ongoing problem, one we need to be aware of, one we need to take action on. Do you think, finally, you know, we like to think of ourselves as sort of a modern society where everybody's welcome, but listening to you this morning, I just wonder, do you think things are actually getting worse in this regard? I think things are getting worse, yeah. I don't like to say it. I think it's a, a, a sort of depressing thing to say, but I feel, um, even just in my time in the job, which is coming up to, to three years, I feel things have got worse in this country, and I think that should be a cause of uh, reflection for us all. Robin Semcox, thanks so much for coming into this, joining us in the studio. It's been fascinating talking to you this morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, you can join in the conversation as well. Remember, you can email me, koonsberg at bbc.co.uk, or if you're social media inclined, you can find the hashtag BBC Laura K on X and also on Instagram. Let's see then what our panel made of the conversations we've been having this morning. Um, Tracy Ann, we spoke to David Lammy about Labour's attitude towards anti Semitism. We've just heard from Robin Simcox there. It's something you've taken a very, very keen interest in. Do you feel Labour's resolved its problem? I think it's been really shocking the last week and uh, very upsetting. You know, we are living, I'm doing a play at the moment, uh, The Merchant of Venice, 1936. I play a female Shylock based on my great grandmother who stood up to Oswald Mosley and the British Union of Fascists and all that anti Semitism that was coming out as taught by Hitler to his great friend Oswald Mosley. Smashing of synagogues, um, you know, desecration of, uh, of, of uh, Jewish schools, all going on in the 30s, daubings, and we're seeing a rise of it now. And I think, you know, what happened in Labour, I think the progressive left has a huge problem with understanding and seeing what anti Semitism, anti Jewish hatred is. And as the headlines have shown this week, the rise in attacks on Jewish students, on Jewish pupils at schools, the fact that a policeman had to tell a man to hide his Star of David because it was seen as an incitement, the fact that I, a Jewish actress, have got to have security 24-7 um, pretty much for putting on the Merchant of Venice in the West End is, is frightening. And many of the attacks that we are getting are coming from the progressive left. You know where you are with the right. You know where you are with hatred on the, on the right and the far right. It's, it's on the left and people that see themselves as freedom fighters that is so deeply upsetting. And, and you were a member of the Labour Party but left in 2016, I, I think partly because of the concern. Yes, absolutely. And when, when you know, the grown-ups in the room, the politicians, are not standing up to deeply anti-Semitic vernacular, mm. this idea, all these 
these medieval tropes of Jews controlling them. I mean, listen, if we were controlling the media, we'd be doing a damn sight better than we <laughs> and it's going on now. You wouldn't have Tim Davy writing letters and uh, of, of apology for in you know in, in systemic anti-Semitism appearing in in the BBC. We're living through really difficult times, and you know what the, the problem is? You can be absolutely appalled by what is going on in Gaza. Mm -hmm. You can absolutely um, hate what Netanyahu and his government is mm -hmm. doing, but to conflate that with the Jewish community <coughs> in Britain and to allow a rise in hatred towards Jews across the board is a real problem because what starts with the Jews doesn't end with the Jews. Well, Robert, let's put that to you as somebody who was in government until relatively recently. The Conservatives have been in charge for a very long time, during which you heard Robin Simcox there. Yeah. It's his job to look at this stuff, and he believes the situation generally has got worse. Yes, and, and I've worked with the CST myself and supported the increase of funding for their vital work, not just in London, but in Manchester and other centres. What Tracy is telling us is a warning, not just from history, but about what is happening now, and I think that whilst government can do a lot to uh, improve the legal framework, as we have done, and fund important groups that deal with the aftermath and with the co consequences, ultimately the causes of this are up to all of us. And I think Robin's message about, you know, the need for this country not to be some sort of moral vacuum, you know, we stand up for the rule of law, we stand up for freedom within those rules, that boundary within which we all exist, but we have responsibilities to each other in order to preserve the very freedoms that we fought in generations to pass. To, to retain. But Douglas, Tracy said very clearly though, your party still has a problem with this in her view. I think the whole of British society has a problem with this. We saw that powerfully evidenced by the CST report just this week. And, and we've talked about that with Robert, but she's asked, she's addressed a very specific yes. point on the progressive left. So let me try and address that directly. There were um, malignant minority voices in the Labour Party that were amplified tragically and horrifically by a previous leader of the Labour Party. On the first day that he assumed the leadership of the Labour Party in 2020, Keir Starmer said, don't judge me by my words, judge me by my actions. And since then, he has relentlessly and methodically sought to root out the cancer, because that's what it is, of anti-Semitism. Let's be clear, it was the former chief rabbi, Lord Jonathan Sachs, who said, through history, the virus of anti-Semitism mutates, but it endures. So it presents itself in different forms, in different times. But that's why, frankly, I agree with Tracy. Our responsibility is not to leave it to the Jewish community to confront anti-Semitism. It is the responsibility of every one of us in the UK to confront anti-Semitism. To do anything else would be to deny our common humanity. Tracy? I mean, I think the recent, the recent um, uh, indication with, with Ali Azir and Graham Jones is that it's... And I think that Keir absolutely has stood up to it and has, mm -hmm. has tried to stamp it out, but there is a problem. There is a problem that this was allowed to continue. The fact that these candidates were supported for a week was really worrying. And for those of us who are looking to Keir mm -hmm. and looking to Labour and wondering, you know, mm -hmm. if and when they get into government, what else, this cancer that you talk about, right, mm -hmm. that is in the heart of Labour, some, some, some of us may feel, uh, with this anti-Jewish feeling and this anti-Jewish vernacular, what, what happens? You know, can you really stamp it out? Can you? I briefly? genuinely believe we can. I think it's not a small matter to say Labour is not going to have a candidate in Rochdale in a by-election. Frankly, lessons should be learned in terms mm. of the process that was followed. But the right outcome was reached consistent with what's been an absolute theme of Keir Starmer's leadership, let's then which talk is to root out that cancer. Let's then talk about the vote on a ceasefire in Gaza, yep. because other people in your party believe an absolute feature of Keir Starmer's leadership has been actually sometimes appearing a bit woolly, and they might suggest that he's doing that this time. He won't vote for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, one would expect, even though Scottish Labour has said, yeah, that's perfectly reasonable, let's do that. What will happen? Well, as a... Uh, Scottish candidate, I'm aware that as the Scottish Labour Party or the Scottish Labour leader, you're criticised if you agree with the UK Labour leader and you're criticised if you don't agree with the UK Labour leader. As far as Keir's concerned, only yesterday at the Munich Security Conference, he said, we all want a ceasefire. The question is, how do we get there? Um, everyone is of a similar mind in saying we want an end to the violence. But the but question the this week is, is will, you, will Labour MPs in yes, Westminster vote for this yes, motion or not? Yes, and I expect not? that there will be very careful consideration when the motion's tabled tomorrow. But frankly, this is bigger than party politics. I disagree profoundly with David Cameron on austerity, on Brexit, on any number of issues. Truthfully, I think he's done a pretty effective job of diplomacy in the Middle East in recent weeks. This is much bigger than what's happening. It's not a parliamentary parlour game. The reality is this morning, 1.4 million Palestinian citizens woke up in Rafah. That is six times the population of that city 
on October the 7th. They've woken up cold, damp, fearful and frightened. That's why when Kamala Harris said yesterday at the Munich Security Conference, Israel does have a right to defend itself, but how it defends itself matters is actually what the international community is trying to communicate at this stage. And there will no doubt be lots of conversation about that in Westminster and around the country this week. Robert, we're about to talk to your colleague, Michael Tomlinson, the Conservative Minister yeah. this morning, after a shocking two defeats for your party in by-elections this week. It's looking pretty catastrophic, isn't it? Well, I've been a by-election candidate myself, and it's nearly 30 years since I fought a very difficult February by-election. Look, they're important political moments, and politicians bury their heads in the sand if they ignore it. However, they're only signals about what might happen. They're not absolute predictors of what will happen. And I can tell you, having been a parliamentary candidate, as Douglas now is, in the 1990s, it doesn't feel the same now as it did then. So this is not over. Well, one of the big conversations in politics right now is people's favourite parlour game. Is it 92 or 97? Because people who follow politics often spend their time doing fun things like imagining which particular <laughs> parallel from the past we should be... 2010. It's 2010. Well, we will only know in time. But there has been a lot of sad Conservative faces this week, as we've said. Not one, but two dreadful defeats at the ballot box in those by-elections. A very tricky time for Rishi Sunak. Defeat in Kingswood near Bristol and Wellingborough in Northamptonshire. The latest in a line of kickings for the government, as Rishi Sunak's many attempts to rebrand and reset seem to have had little effect at all. But the Immigration Minister, Michael Tomlinson, joins us for the first time this morning to talk about this and other issues. You're well, very welcome to the studio. Thank you very much indeed. Now, these by-elections are not blips. They're not one-offs. There have been plenty of them that have all been dreadful for you. You've been behind in the polls for many, many months. Whatever you try, it's not working, is it? Well, I agree with what Robert said just a few moments ago. There's no doubt that these by-elections were set against a very difficult backdrop. I was in Kingswood um, myself a, a few weeks ago. I saw that the, the excellent candidate and the campaign on the ground. But actually, if you look at it, if, if you look at, for example, reforms vote, which people have been talking about this week, what comes across to me is it's very clear that a, a vote for reform is actually a vote to let Labour in. And that is a very clear message that I've taken away, one of the clear messages that I've taken away from these by-elections. But the clear message is that voters don't like what Rishi Sunak is offering them. And it's not just the last week. They've been Somerton and Frome in the, in the south-west, Selby and Ainsley in the north, Tamworth in the Midlands, Med Bedfordshire in the south-east. This is a long line of kickings since Rishi Sunak has been in. Voters don't want what he's offering. Well, as I said, these have been very difficult circumstances and, and a difficult backdrop. You mentioned by-elections. Governments don't traditionally win by-elections. That, that is absolutely right. We saw the turnout in the by-elections very different from the sort of turnout that you get at a general election. We're in the 30s um, or thereabouts for the by-elections, much higher likely to be the 60s or hopefully uh, towards the 70s in a general election. But it has been a very difficult backdrop. But one of the messages uh, that I've received, as I said, is in relation to reform. A vote for reform just simply lets Labour in. But that's not a message from voters. That's voters choosing to go somewhere else because they don't like what you have been putting on the table. And more than a year ago, Rishi Sunak said, judge me on my actions. Mm. Judge me on his famous pledges that he put forward. It looks like people are doing exactly what he asked them to. They're judging him and they're judging that he's failing. Well, let's look at those pledges. And the first pledge was in relation to inflation. And everyone said it was an ambitious um, pledge, an ambitious plan, if you like. And well, hang in the, on. Run the Bank well, of England had already forecast it was going to fall. So no, it that, was not seen at the time well, Laura, as if the thing was completely impossible. Oh, Laura, res respectfully, there were doubters. There was a time where people doubted that the Prime Minister, Rishi <laughs> Sunak, would actually meet uh, his ambition, his pledge. He did that. 11.1% it was um, back in 2022. Now at 4%. Well, more, let, than, let's more than match. Let's that. then look at the other pledges. We're in recession. He pledged to grow the economy. We're in recession. Debt is not falling. It is growing. The boats haven't stopped. And hospital waiting lists are getting longer. Well, let, let me take those. In relation, to, uh, in relation to growing the economy, the biggest stumbling block, if you like, the biggest barrier to growing the economy is having high inflation. So we're seeing that moving in the right direction with predictions. Um, that there will be growth in the future from the OBR, from the OECD, from the Bank of England, the, the IMF and others, predicting that there will be growth that will grow faster than France, Italy, Germany um, and Japan. But you but know you too it's predicted to be very, very measly 
And I suppose the question I'm really asking you is about Rishi Sunak essentially sort of offered a contract to the public, didn't he, as the new prime minister taking over after the chaos of Liz Truss. He said, trust me with these five things I am going to do for you. And on several of them, things have been going in the wrong direction. Voters have clocked that and they are judging him harshly. Laura, the, the task that he set me is the fifth, the final one of those pledges that, that you mentioned, stopping the boats. That has been the challenge that he has set me. That's my, my job title, if you like. And look at last year. Look at what happened. We saw boats crossings down by a, over a third, a 16,000 fewer people getting across. You're right, the job is not yet done. We still have, for example, the deterrent effect that we need to put in, the Rwanda bill. We'll see that tomorrow coming back to the House of Lords in committee stage and then it's got to come through to report stage. And when that comes back to the House of Commons, and when we make that law, as I believe that we will, mm -hmm. that's when we can ratify the treaty and make sure that we can get planes off the ground, because the deterrent effect can and will work. You hope there is no firm evidence that it definitively will. And before you perhaps give the metaphor, the, the illustration of Australia, which the former Home Secretary Suella Braverman did, Australia is a completely different geographical setup. There is nothing guaranteed about a deterrent effect coming from you actually getting planes to Rwanda, if indeed you are actually able to do that. And you mention their progress on the boats, except if you look at the Home Office's own figures, your department, January 2023, 1,180 migrants arrived. January 2024, 1,223. So actually it's up slightly if you look at the details. Well, let's, let's take those one at a time. You mentioned Australia. Let me mention another country beginning with A, Albania. The Prime Minister secured a deal back in December 2022 with Albania. And what did we see last year? Crossings down by 90%. Those coming from Albania trying to get on board on small boats down by 90%. So the deterrent effect, you mentioned Australia, mm -hmm. um, Albania, it has worked. In terms of the figures, they are coming down. We need to see those figures coming down even even further. Laura, my mission is, I believe, a moral mission. We have seen in every one of the past three months people drowning in the channel. The, the criminal gangs, the people smugglers, they do not care if you are going to live or die. They want to pack as many people onto those flimsy boats, boats that I saw 48 hours ago when I was over in France speaking to my French counterparts and seeing the work that they are doing to help us in our joint mission to stop the boats. The criminal gangs do not care if you're going to live or die. It is a moral imperative that we resolve and that it. We have be... made progress, we must make more. But that might be why a lot of our viewers hearing this morning that there's almost exactly the same number in January 24 as there were 23. It's actually gone slightly up. Again, that's, it's not working what you're trying to do. Well, I think it's, it's difficult to say, look at one month's figures or a few weeks figures and try and compare that. If you look at the whole year, this is what I'm trying to say, Laura. If you look at the whole of last year, when there were predictions that the crossings would skyrocket rocket, they would double. No, they went down. And when you look at crossings, um, for example, into Europe, mm -hmm. to Italy, they were up 80%. And yet we have managed. The plan is working. And this is the challenge. Are you going to stick with a plan that is working with the Prime Minister? Or are you going to go back to square one but with Labour? But the Prime Minister's promise to the public was to stop the votes. It was not stop the stop boats, boats, rather boats, rather than stopping the votes. Seems to, to be actually boats, what's happening at by-elections. Right. People are increase stopping the their votes, votes for the, the Conservatives. Right. But his promise was to stop the boats. Mm. That is not happening. That has not happened yet. That is a challenge and a task that he has set me. Uh, the figures are moving in the right direction. There is more that we must do. I was in France 48 hours ago mm. seeing and our partnership work there. That is working. We must work upstream as well, making sure that the boats don't get there. Even when I was in France, we saw one of those boats that was on its way to try and make one of those perilous journeys being seized. The plan is working. We need to stick with the plan. Well, our viewers will make their own judgment about whether or not it is working. I want to ask you, about a specific part of your job at the Home Office, a different bit. Now, there were 22,000 asylum seekers who arrived here between March and July last year. Mm -hmm. They're not eligible to be sent to Rwanda because the legislation, the new law, would only apply from July, nor can they legally claim asylum. So they are stuck. Was it a mistake to create that loophole? 
No, listen, what, what's happened is that there's been a decision to pause, and I think that is right. We've had the Supreme Court judgment last year. It was on the 15th of November. And it's right, I think, that the government and the Home Secretary and I have the opportunity to pause and reflect. That's what's happening now. I mentioned the bill and the treaty. The treaty was signed last year on the, the 5th of December. On, the bill are, is going through Parliament. Hang on, but these are people to whom that new law you want to pass does not apply. There are more than 20,000 people stuck in a legal limbo because of this loophole that the government's law has created. What are you going to do with them? Well, Laura, that's not quite right, because as I was explaining, the bill, when it comes in, means that there is the solution in relation to Rwanda, means that we can get planes off the ground, and so we need to get that bill to come through. But, my, but um, to directly answer your question, it was the right thing to do to reflect on the Supreme Court judgment of the 15th of November. The government responded with the treaty and with the bill. That is coming through Parliament. It's back in the House of Lords but tomorrow, me, and you, we need to get that on the statute But are you suggesting books. that when that law is passed, it will also apply to these people who are stuck in limbo. That is exactly right. The Rwanda plan means that planes will be able to take off the ground and it will include those who are already here. That is exactly right. OK. Except that there are people stuck in that loophole right now, more than 20,000 of them. There are also more than 90,000 people who arrived since June 22 who are also stuck in the backlog. It's a shambles, isn't well, it? Well, th this is why I am pressing, and this is why we must get the legislation through as quickly as possible. I've mentioned the treaty. The bill is coming through Parliament. It's got to go through its parliamentary process. It's the third day in committee tomorrow in the House of Lords. It'll then come back, I'm sure, for parliamentary ping-pong. Um, but I want to get that through as quickly as possible. And when it does, we can get those planes off the ground. OK. Uh, I won't ask you to bet whether or not those planes will ever leave. Um, that happened in a different interview, in a different programme. I'm not going to ask you to do that, but very, very good to have you in with us in the studio this morning. Michael Laura, Thomas. thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you very you. much indeed. Now for something totally different. It is Sunday, so let's have some sparkle after a lot of serious and important discussions. Because Doctor Who is now becoming Dr Thomas Stockman. Yes, the star actor Matt Smith, the 11th Doctor, is on London's West End stage in a 19th century play, An Enemy of the People. I met him and asked why this story about power, money and the truth is still relevant today. I think perhaps because the truth is undermined so consistently and, and I, think, I think that's one of the problems that Thomas really struggles with. It's, it's this idea I think that um, I think that is quite true to now, you know, that there's so much disinformation and misinformation and, and um, I think, um, you know, I think uh, it's one, one has to find their own route to the truth nowadays a bit. Does that make sense? It does make sense. I think a lot of people will hear that and... and find that resonates sometime, somehow with them. Yeah, yeah, you know, because there's so much sort of, like, rubbish on the internet now that, that, that and, and, you know, people can say anything and, and, and sort of purport it to be the truth. So, look, I think, broadly speaking, there are a lot of themes in this play that I think feel very prevalent and present. A few days ago, had someone tried to muzzle me on the subject, I would have fought for my right to speak until my last breath, but that all seems irrelevant now after what I've experienced. I've made a discovery. Even though it was written in the 19th century, you're very much hitting things that will hit a nerve with people today, and you even like yeah. involve the audience. We now, that's do. quite a risk. I mean, looking out there, it looks a bit scary to me. You, in, you invite people to participate. It never it? stops looking scary, that place. I <laughs> really? tell you. Yeah, well, kind of, yeah. Every day you think, why am I doing a play? What have I done? Um, no, so there's a sort of, like, uh, a town hall meeting, essentially, that comes in the second act of the play, where the audience are invited to participate. But do you ever worry that you're going to lose control of the audience? You know, it might be like a really... I want to lose control. Really? Yeah, because that's what the theatre is about. And I think we need, to, we, like, we need to lose control a bit, don't we? It's interesting, though, you want people to have a really strong reaction. Um, yes. On the show last week, Ray Fiennes said that trigger warnings should go. I agree. People should be shocked. I agree. I, I watched it. I agree with Rafe utterly and completely. That's why we go to the theatre, isn't it? To be shocked, to be arrested out of ourselves, to recognise ourselves in front and with an audience. I also agree that if there are strobes or whatever, there are some things it makes sense, but, you know, I, I worry sometimes that we're moving towards a sort of sanitised version of everything and we're stripping the danger and the invention and the ingenuity out of... Like, isn't art meant to be dangerous? It's like, you know, I, I, I always thought that that was one of the great things of doing the Doctor Who is that you scared children, but in a controlled way. But you, but you did scare them, 
I mean, imagine you go to, to kids watching Doctor Who, by the way, this might scare you. No. I, 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 uh, I'm not into it. Let's talk then about Doctor Who. I read that when you accepted Doctor Who, when you were 27. 26. You're 26. Yeah, yeah. You weren't sure that you'd done the right thing, becoming the 11th Doctor, is that true? I was young and sort of foolish. <laughs> I'm still foolish, I'm just older. And um, I thought, well, would, you know, would I just always be Doctor Who? Mm -hmm. um, and then I realised, actually, always being Doctor Who is amazing. It's not a bad thing. It's a great thing. It's still, you know, one of the great pleasures of my life. I'm so, so proud of that show. And, pr and it's just the most amazing part. Suddenly, you're Doctor Who. So children are like, no way! Like you're you're a doctor, and you're like, yeah, man, I am, and and that um and for my family, and and it was just uh, yeah, a really extraordinary life moment. Do kids still come up to you? Yeah, yeah, but obviously it's moved on, and now it's all about shoots, and uh, but yeah, but interestingly, like now they're like eighteen, and they're like, oh, when I was young, you were really cool. Well, yeah, I'm not now, but. <laughs> Would you ever do a David Tennant and go back to the TARDIS for one one last time? Fancy another no, spin? Never say never. <laughs> never say never. You say there you love inhabiting a character, you know, spending time with characters. Yeah. And of course, one of the characters you spent a lot of time with was somebody from real life, Prince Philip. Big Phil. Is that what you called him, Big Phil? Big Phil. I love Big Phil. I will not kneel before my wife. But your wife is not asking you to. But my queen commands me. Yes. I beg you make an exception for me. No. I told my granddad that I was, I was, I got that part. I went, bloody hell, you're not playing that book. I couldn't bear him. My granddad couldn't bear him. He was very, he wasn't very into the royal family. But I just loved him. I got the, the, the all of the research I did. I thought, what an extraordinary, forward-thinking, uh, deeply funny, um, irascible, brilliant man he was. Is it true Prince Harry called you grandpa? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. He was like, all right, granddad. I was like, all right, mate. And is it true that the late Queen used to watch The Crown you heard on a projector? I heard in Buckingham this. Palace? This might be an old wives' tale, but I heard she watched it with a member. But again, see, this is the problem, isn't it? Because it generates a sort of level of gossip around them that they probably don't want. Mm. But by the same notion, without, um, without sort of being too presumptuous about it, has it done them, you know, is it, has there been some, has it created a degree of intrigue about mm -hmm. them as well that perhaps. You know, has it has it modernised them in a way? Has it has it helped people empathise with them? Let's talk about something that is definitely fiction. Yeah. The Game of Thrones spin-off. Yes. House of the Dragon. Yeah. You played Prince Damon. Yes. Yes. Now it's said that the second series is going to be very very gory. How gory is it really going to be? Because the first series ends with the war about to kick off. As you'd expect, all the bells and whistles of gore and madness and relationships flying around all over the place and we've got some wonderful new characters coming in some wonderful new actors mm -hmm. who, are, who are on board the great freddie fox has joined uh, which i'm delighted about um and uh yeah hopefully we can deliver something again of, of great scale and ambition and you know and and that has the essence and the tenacity of of those books blood and guts blood and guts and you know just odd relationships and politics, like small p politics. Yeah, yeah. What kind of yeah. politicians do you think would do well in that environment? Oh, stick a wig on them all and see how they get on, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Smith has been really great to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, Thank good you to so talk to you for too. Time. Thanks for your time. The irascible Matt Smith there. Well, you have been busy getting in touch this morning. Thank you for your emails, mainly about Alexei Navalny. Bob Mundell says we should stop talking and take action using the frozen assets of Russia to arm and rebuild Ukraine. Kieran Montague says it's time to cut off all diplomatic ties with Russia and double down on provision of assistance to Ukraine. Richard Craven says Putin has got away with far too much for too long. Russia has killed people on foreign soil, including here in the UK. Keep your messages coming. We do read them all. All three of you, though, I am tempted to pick up on what Matt Smith was suggesting there. And Tracy, and you were in Doctor Who too. I was. His suggestion of putting politicians in wigs, chucking them into Game of Thrones and seeing how they got on. Is politics a bit of a performance? It's total Game of Thrones without the dragons, isn't it? I mean, if you, if you look at it, <laughs> it's all dragon? sex and blood and gore and intrigue <laughs> and people, you know. <laughs> Is that a good theory? I mean, do you think politics has to be a bit of a performance? I mean, you're in a very dramatic performance at the moment of the Merchant of Venice, but these kind of, you know, big 
egos and drama and ambition. Yeah, I mean, no disrespect, but I think mm -hmm. you've got to be, in this current climate, you've got to be slightly crazy to be a politician. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, these are dark and dangerous times. But I do think, um, I mean, my dad was always desperate for me to be in law and he used to make me watch Rumpole of the Bailey and say, <laughs> look, you see, it's like acting. They just wear wigs and shout a lot. So one could say with politicians exactly that. It is a bit showbiz. Well, and Robert, you were even a well, lawyer. I mean, a it was case, my life. You know, was Wearing your... a wig was part of my daily life and I still have my wig. I've never worn a wig because <laughs> it's you know I'm still a practicing I'm still a practicing lawyer um, and uh, though I would say look it, it's all right it, it should be about the doing remind yourself every day you look in the mirror in politics what am I here to do not what am I here to be and that's certainly what I've I, I've been in the getting stuff done brigade all my political career and that's what I'm going to continue to do do you think actually well, we're on that point, continuing to do with everything as it is. Do you think you're going to be able to hang on to your seat? Well, look, my seat has always been a marginal. I won it from Labour in 2010. I've never taken it for granted. Uh, I've, I've won elections. I've lost elections. What I do know is that I still will care about the issues like autism, like uh, the law and politics that have driven me throughout my life. And wigs. And wigs and what you achieve by de uh, defending justice. Douglas, I'm interested that you want to come back as an MP. You were an MP for a long time and a very senior minister yep. in uh, new Labour governments. I mean, as Tracy Ann suggested, some people might think, why do you, why do you want to come back? And, and how has it yeah, changed in the time you've been away? Well, honestly, I'm learning in terms of how things are different. I've spent the last eight years now uh, having the great privilege of teaching in some of the world's finest universities. I've spent a lot of time away from the UK and away from politics. But I genuinely believe politics still matters. And in that sense, I take nothing for granted. I'm working hard to win people's support. One way that I think politics has changed is it has become more performative. Mm. And if you think about the politicians that I grew up with, who I knew and revered, people mm. like John Smith, people like Alistair Darling, they were rubbish actors and brilliant politicians. Yeah. And in that sense, the privilege of actually trying to make a difference has drawn me back into the public realm, but not a single vote's been cast. We're working hard to win people's support. Oh, that's a very, very candidate on the message answer, isn't it? <laughs> and actually, I think from, from my point of view, like in mean, the play that I'm doing, we're bringing, I think I've noticed that theatre is much more about bringing politics into, into theatre as well. Mm. So I think that there is, a, there is a merging. I think ultimately everything is political. Everything is political. <laughs> it is. Everything is political and is showbiz still a p present company accepted? Politics still showbiz for ugly people? I mean, look at these gorgeous men. Objective. How can you we say that? <laughs> Excuse me. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> it's a present company accepted. So <laughs> But there's just, just this vanity, though, too, isn't it? Is that fair? Well, look, I, I, yes, but let's, let's get back to the message here. You know, uh, as Douglas says, you know, it doesn't matter what you look like, it's what you do, and you get judged by your actions, not uh, uh, how you present them. The kind of American model of what you look like and those big, you know, those big TV appearances and then the, the fight off with each other, like Halloween has become our November the 5th, you know, takeover. Mm -hmm. um, that American performative politics and, and cult of publicity, yeah, of cult of personality feels that it's gone into our politics more Very than it probably should have done. Yes. Well, thank you all three of you for your excellent television appearances this morning. <laughs> I wasn't trying to offend you by using that old cliche. Tracy Ann, Robert and Douglas, thank you so much for spending your morning with us. Thank you you for spending your special Sunday morning with us when we've been having some fun but also mulling over the massive challenges for our politicians right now not just trying to get your votes but grappling with prejudice in our society and grasping for any solution to the nightmare problem of Vladimir Putin it is not a pretty list you can always go to iPlayer to catch up or join me and Paddy O'Connell on Sunday's newscast on BBC Sounds later and I'll be checking in on Thursdays now too with a new newsletter off air. You can sign up to that here, bbc.co.uk forward slash Laura K newsletter. Feels like there is no escape. Sorry about that. But I will look forward very much to seeing you next Sunday, same time, same place.